is, and I'm sure that's a handful. So how do you like manage and balance being a mother and a professional? And what sacrifices did you give professionally and personally to achieve where you are? Like talking about the preteens that I have, it's actually a tougher job than being a director with Unilever. It, it's clearly a tougher, tougher job. I think, uh, you know, for me, balance, I, it was only when I hit my 40s that I realized that the balance is not what, how the world defines that balance for me. It is what balance for myself is. And a lot of women, I, I think, in Pakistan are almost subjugated to an impression of balance which either the mother, never the fathers, I think the mothers or the mothers-in-law impose on them as being the balance of life that they, they, they require. Now, and, and I spent most of my 30s wanting to live up to a certain balance that I thought society kind of set for me. The balance would be the ideal kids, the ideal home, the ideal parties that my husband threw, the ideal, you know, job progression. In my 40s, I finally realized the balance has to be what I actually think as balance. So if I come home and I see my sons, both of them not having seen me all day long, still being very happy, being very well adjusted, for me that is a balance that I've struck that day, in spite of the fact that I might today become going back home at 7.30, 8 o'clock. So that, that balance is perfectly all right. You know, it, it was finally when I hit my 40s that I realized that the balance of, of business, supposing, there were all those conscious moments of me saying, but if I say no to this job, if I say no to moving off, off to an Indonesia or a very impossible stint in, in London, how will they perceive me? That is not balance. If I could come back after saying a no and still create the most amazingly, you know, competitively placed uh, uh, capability with Unilever, still come home to smiling husband and smiling kids, that was balance for me. So I think a lot of, I, you know, the, the only thing that I talk, I, I, I talk to a lot of women in, in my office, and I keep telling them, don't get subjugated to even what I feel is my balance. A lot of them will come to me and say, but you tell us how do you create balance. You know, we always see your pictures on Facebook. We always see, first, don't buy anything that's on Facebook. I will never put, put my crying face on Facebook and say, you know what, but today my mother-in-law was very unhappy with me. Who will ever do that? Who will? Right? So first, get, get over this, you know, fakeness that we all create on each other in terms of, I have the ideal life, I look ideal, my husband looks ideal, my kids look ideal, my job looks ideal. There is no ideal. For working women, I think the balance or, or the interpretation of ideal is what I think is ideal. Right? And, and you've talked about, about challenges. I, I also think when a lot of people talk about balance, they don't realize that balance is not in the moment. So if you tell me today, Am I leading a very balanced uh, day? No, I, I need to spend a lot more time at work today. I couldn't, I want to be at home. My son has a, has a test tomorrow. I'm not at home. Today is not the ideal balance. If I now stretch that occasion to, let's say, five years, do I think I've lived a very balanced life? I think I have. So a lot of us, again, women in particular, I don't see men ever kind of stressing themselves over, aaj humne kitna balance create kiya? how much time did we spend with our wife today? How much time did we spend with our, with our parents today? But a lot of women do that in the moment. So I, I, for me, the toughest job that I have ever said yes to was moving off to, to Turkey. And my husband is a local entrepreneur. So he said, nothing doing. I mean, you know, you need to get to the board of Unilever. I've supported you as, mu as much as I possibly could. I'm not going to leave with you. And, and, and clearly so. He's the lead career option in, in our relationship. So I said, okay, the kids are going to stay in Pakistan. And I'll tell you why. Because they had an entire infrastructure. Their balance was in Pakistan. So I didn't want to redefine their balance by going to Turkey. My husband's balance was clearly in Pakistan. I said, I will imbalance one person who is Farin herself. Was I able to create a balance after two years of being in Turkey? Absolutely. Because I didn't judge myself during those two years. I judged myself after coming back to Pakistan, looking back and saying, you know, Yahoo, I've been able to do it for two years. So two years I actually worked out of Turkey. Just, just last thing I like to say on impediments, because a lot of us, you know, there, there are impediments. I think there are impediments for us. There are impediments to a lot of men I actually work with too. You know, old parents happen, unwell wives happen, unwell kids happen, you know, uh, a disobedient uh, kid happens. So, so there, there are impediments in everyone's life. The only, the only thing that I think women are very harsh on themselves about is, and I'm very fond of saying this again and again and again, when you are faced with a challenge, when you're faced with a breakdown, do you reach out to men and women around yourself and say, you know what, I'm breaking down and I need help. Again, I'll, I'll just give this one last reference. Turkey happened. You know, I was leaving for Turkey, and I just thought I'm not going to be able to survive a typical, you know, four weeks in Turkey kind of uh, mandate with the company. I asked them, I said, I, I think I'll have to say no all over again to a secondment. Could you guys give me three weeks in Turkey, one week in Pakistan? I'll come be with my kids for like from one, you know, Saturday morning to the next Monday morning. Will you do that for me? If I wouldn't have asked, so nobody ever had done that at Unilever. Nobody ever in Turkey had done that, you know, uh, for a resource. When I asked, if the whole system went into this automatic gear of supporting me and making that happen for me. But if I wouldn't have asked, 
And when he said, many times during those two years, I kept asking myself, what if I would not have asked? Because a lot of us say, impediment ho gaya, ab now I'm such a tough woman, I'll never tell people I'm in trouble, I'll never tell them I'm breaking down. I will show them I'm in Turkey, jaungi, emotionally mar jaungi, you know, bache taba ho jayenge, miya dousi shadi kar lega, but I will show a tough face. <laughs> Nothing that will happen. Just tell them you need to be back. There were many meetings that I did on Skype, because my son was unwell, and I said, you know what, oops, sorry, I will not come back today. I will come to Istanbul tomorrow, today my son needs me. Did anything falter apart in my career? Nothing. Did anything falter apart on my business? No. But just that fact of being able to tell people that you're in pain and you're in trouble, I think a lot of women don't do that. Yeah, thank you so much, Farin. That was extremely insightful. I think your personal experiences that you narrated have, been, have rung a bell with quite a few women over here. And the Facebook part too. I, I truly believe that. Saira, coming to you, you know, we know you like work for National Foods and it's like a local company but with international standards. And what are the policies that your company has adopted towards gender equality in the organization? Um, Assalamu alaikum everyone. Muniza, uh, adding on to what Farheen had said, it takes one to encourage another one. Uh, fortunately for us from the founding fathers at National Foods, uh, the current management also, uh, the mindset has always been very uh, modernistic and futuristic. Uh, instead of reinventing the wheel, what was important for us to was to pick up good practices across the country which were kept within the framework of the cultural and the norms that we have. So, we have a daycare center uh, for uh, the males and females. Also for males. Also that, for males. Great, so, because as Farheen said, initiative. fathers also need that support. Uh, we also have flexi timings and flexi timings are across the organization. Uh, males tend to enjoy more flexi timings in terms of the slots they can pick. Females, irrespective of whether they are mothers, or they are married or not married, uh, there are some single parents also. The flexi timing is said, yes, it's not a policy, it's encouraged. So we would encourage you to come and deliver on your work and go home, manage. Because I'm not married, but at the same time, I have parents, I have a house, I have certain responsibilities. And in my five years with National Foods, I've never found a reason not to attend to them just because it was work. Um, at times it has cost the company financially also and nobody has blinked an eye. And um, again, uh, transport, pick and drop. The biggest issue that we face where a lot of females tend to not join the workforce is the environment. So we would encourage parents, husbands to come have lunch in our cafeteria because food is served there. We're currently working on uh, a wellness campaign where one of the things that women don't do, they have house, they have responsibilities, time for themselves. So we are currently, uh, we got a question today that we've not celebrated Women's Day at National Foods this year. It is, we don't want to just have a lunch or a tea. We are do looking at something sustainable. So the wellness program is something which we are putting into within our work slots, where the women will take out half an hour, get their nutrition plans done, and get on to a Pilates or a yoga led by females. So within the culture, and then it's a mix session for the gents after that. Uh, we've also recently, IFC has written a case study on national foods. It's available. Uh, the link is there. Uh, we're strongly working with Pakistan Business Council. For us, women are the core of everything. Something that uh, a lot of HR practitioners do is, and I get really irritated is the fact that uh, every time a female candidate comes in, irrespective of their age, the first question they ask is, are you married? Nobody ever asks a man. So I make it a point to question all the men, are you married? Are you planning to stick to us? Because for our factories, a lot of times the men turn around and say, we can't move because my children go to school. Nobody asks that question of the men. So I make it a point to ask, so are you planning to stick? Are you okay to going to the factory? Uh, so those are some of the policies that we are currently having. One policy that we adhere strongly to. We do not let, we agree it's equal opportunity. We do not let our female employees travel to outskirts without being uh, accompanied by a male colleague. Currently, the only department that we are struggling with is sales. We don't have female uh, population in sales. So we've decided to take a cut back on the capability 
professional capability, not the potential, and hire females. So uh, National Foods is a local company, but running at par with all the MNCs. Yeah, that's why I said a local company with international standards. And I hope other companies follow suit and you know, lead, that you can lead by example for them. Okay, Faraz, coming to you. Sadia spoke about some unconscious bias. So if I can build my question on that, you know, there is a lot of unconscious bias regarding genders. For example, women are supposed to be emotional. Women are not supposed to be good drivers. They're not supposed to be good with numbers. So how do we tackle this gender bias which really pulls ones down? So what is your view on that? Thank you. Um, being the first male panelist, I think there's a huge responsibility. But let me just take a step back. Um, I, I look at, whenever I think about uh, females and, and women, I, I look at it from three perspectives, three lenses. Uh, one is as a father, as a husband. The other is as a citizen. And third is as an employer and a colleague. Now, when you have got these three lenses and you look at the world that you live in, you know, there's a lot of disappointments. There's a lot of responsibility that uh, Faraz, I think... I'm so sorry to interrupt you. They're thinking you just stop think, for yes. two seconds Thank you. for the Azan Thank you so like. much. Thank you. panel discussion and give the prayer break after the panel discussion is over. Faraz, could you continue please with what you said? Sorry. Um, so when you look at, uh, this, at this issue uh, from the perspective of a father, a husband, a colleague um, and a citizen, uh, there's a lot of disappointment as I was saying earlier. How can we make things better? Um, I don't think we need to do much. We just need to be fair, make sure meritocracy is there. And I, sh I, I promise you, if we are fair and meritocracy is there, um, women are going to take over. Uh, it, it's a matter of just time. That's it. You just have to be fair. Now, creating that environment of fairness and, and meritocracy, now that is the challenge. And I want to actually share couple of examples that probably a lot of some people might not like. There are institutions, there are social clubs that are right at the top that can create precedences and they don't do that. There is a particular club right across the road who do not allow so female uh, memberships. Now as a principal, I don't think I will ever get membership over there after saying this <laughs> and I'm glad I, won't, I would not get that because why is that? Why a, a female or, or a woman cannot be a member of a particular club? So, and that is the top echelon of, of uh, our society, so-called. The other thing, and these things need to be called out, because that's where the trickle-down effect comes in. A uh, few of us might, might be the members over there. I think we as, as, as men need to actually make uh, an effort to actually change these paradigms. Second, three years ago, um, a colleague of ours joined us and she shared this anecdote of a financial service inst institution. Like you said, that when she joined, um, she was asked, are you married? Yes. Any plans of uh, having a baby? And uh, she said no. And then after six months, she got pregnant. And the HR of that institution called her and said, but you said you are not going to get pregnant. And she said, oh, I'm really sorry. Now, this is the conversation that is happening at one of the top banks in the country. And she said, what do you want me to do? She was like, oh, the HR personnel said, well, um, let's see, two months down the road, she Another grievance came that you are, the environment that you're creating around you is not conducive for work. She put a legal suit. 
And three months down the, down the road, the, uh, the gynecologist just said, please take the case away because it's actually putting a lot of um, effect on you. And she had to take that case back. And she regrets it today. Now, if at the top institutional level, at societal level, if we cannot make these changes, I really don't think we're going to go far. As, our, as an institution, and I, 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 you, any one of you is more than welcome to come and, and have a look at that. We have a portfolio of 12 companies, out of which the CEO of eight are women. And they are not because we thought, oh, it should be more inclusive. It was not because we thought, oh, in uh, my uh, annual report, pe ye cheez lagegi. it was simply they were good. They took a company from A to, 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 to Z in, 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 a, in a far more efficient manner, and, and they're good in terms of value and wealth both. As a business, it's, it's a great decision. So it's just a matter of creating a, a fair culture where equal opportunities, genuinely equal opportunities, not as a trademark, should be given out. And you will change the whole paradigm. You'll see the paradigm change in not only institutions, but society as well. So it's, it's fairly simple if there is will. So thank you so much, Faraz, especially for bringing up that matter of the particular club, because I think we have members over here from that club, and I hope they can take our case forward. OK, Asim, coming to you. So you know, I have a very specific question for you. What roles are women in your talent pipeline in your firm? I ask you this you know, because out of all the big four firms, I think Eva is the only one which does not have a female partner as yet. Yeah. So KPMG has two, and uh, PwC has one, and Deloitte also has one just recently. So uh, how, how, what is the reason what, that stops you from having a female partner on board? Well. It, it's, it's not deliberate, uh, but you know, there is background to it. Uh, we would have had a female partner back in 2012, uh, and things didn't work out at a, at a global, at a regional level. Uh, they were not taking uh, any partners that year, so nobody came on board. She was very disappointed, and, and, and she left. So you know, that was a great loss for us, because she was one of the best uh, candidates at that point in time. And uh, there was just uh, country discrimination rather than uh, gender discrimination at that point. But uh, over the last, I think particularly the last seven or eight years, we've been encouraging uh, women to, to get on, to, to stay on um, and, and build up. So if you look at any of our business units, we have a number of women that are there uh, in senior manager positions and, and you know, getting on to the glide path towards uh, partnership, hopefully. Uh, so, uh, very much on the agenda. Um, there also used to be an issue in terms of the number of people uh, that were being recruited, uh, both at the training level, uh, where there was subconsciously people were saying, well, let's not make it more than 10, 15 percent. And, 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 you know, what I've been saying is there should be no cap. I mean, uh, the problem only is the flow that's actually coming in into the profession or into the stream. Uh, because I think after they complete their training uh, and, and you know want to get on to uh, the professional life, a lot of uh, senior managers would say that you know let's not get this woman uh, because you know she's going to get married, she's going to leave anyway. And my response always was, well, if you get a guy, he's going to get a job in Middle East and go away anyway. So what difference does it make? People move on. Uh, you've got to get people the same amount of opportunities. Uh, and, you know, my experience has been that, you know, women actually have been much more loyal, uh, you know, much more focused uh, and, and, you know, uh, has have developed better teams. So, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, things change and, and we're able to put a lot of these women that are in the pipeline up to the uh, partnership slot. And what I keep telling them is just because you've got a boss who's a man doesn't mean that you've got to always stay behind. You know, you can come along the side develop your business case and, and push forward. Uh, and, and, you know, what we are actually looking at is, is plans in terms of, uh, you know, uh, identifying a certain minimum number of women that should be in certain, in, in different positions. So I'm hoping that things change and, and, and we build up and give them better opportunities to, to move forward. Because I think 
Many of these women that are just behind the guys are actually better than the guys that they report to. So we have in the audience some female chartered accountants from EY. I'm sure there's going to be good news for them. It augurs well for them. Okay, <laughs> Sadia, coming back to you. You've authored a book on corporate governance and we all know how much lobbying we had to do with the SECP 